Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Today, our Sabbath school lesson is Come to Me. And we have teaching today Greg and Mary and myself, Byron. Before we go any further, though, let's invite the most important part of Sabbath school, the Holy Spirit. Greg, could you pray for us? Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Sabbath time that we could spend with you. We ask and pray now to send your Holy Spirit to be with us, to help us, to guide us and direct us. And Lord, may each word that comes out of our mouth be from you through your Holy Spirit. And we ask and pray for a special blessing upon those who are listening, that they will be blessed and led closer and closer to you each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay, so for today's memory verse, it's Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that's very appropriate verse for this week's lesson, come to me. So originally we were made perfect, filled with the glory of God created in his image. After the sixth day of creation, we rested on the seventh day. We communed with God. And a complete rest in the Lord. Literally perfection. Then sin enters the world with disobedience at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Hence our carnal nature was born and the restlessness that continues to this day stemmed from that carnal nature. We see it come to fruition with Cain and Abel when he kills Abel. The first generation born of sin. We read in Genesis 5, 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he became a father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image. And that's Adam. And he named him Seth. But we also know that Cain and Abel were born in the same way. Everyone born from Adam and Eve, that's all of us, were born with that condition born in the likeness and image of our first parents, not God, born to carnal flesh, forever restless without God, always trying to fill that void, that longing that we have inside with the world and its pleasures, but that is only a temporary patch. Let's also consider the sins of our past, the guilt and shame that comes along with it. You've heard the phrase, that so-and-so has a lot of baggage? I got news for you, we all have baggage. Some more than others, but everyone um, is still, it's still a chore to carry. It's a heavy load and burden, whether it's visible or not. Another thing we receive from the cardinal flesh is selfishness. I know it all comes down to me first. Isn't that the mentality? Or as I used to live, say when I lived in New Jersey, how does that affect me? Even as children, this character defect is clearly visible. To do it ourselves and to be self-sufficient. I think Frank Sinatra said it best with this song, I did it my way. Really, Frank? So we love to run the show. We have to be in charge. We need to be part of the solution, or so we think. Today's lesson, Come to Me, as the only way to truly fill that void, that emptiness, and to give us peace. So the question then is how? We're going to focus on Matthew 11, 28 through 30 in this opening segment. I'm going to read um, starting at verse 28. Come to me, all of you, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest from your, for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We are going to look at three points in this scripture today. Three things that are vital to us finding rest in Christ Jesus. Number one, in verse 28, come unto me. Jesus will never force us to accept him. God is love. And love does not force or coerce anyone to come to it. John 4, 10, verses 10 and 14. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is, 
who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him shall never thirst, but the water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. This is what God is offering us if we come to him. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication <clears throat> with thanksgiving, <clears throat> let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That sounds like a pretty good offer. We will see in today's lesson the only cure for the carnal, carnal mind and flesh we are born in with is Christ Jesus. He is Amen. our source to relieve our burdens and to give us true peace. The source of the well springing up to eternal life. For the second note is verse 29. Take my yoke. What is the difference between the yoke of Christ and your own yoke? Verse 30 says that for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I know we're going to touch on this today in depth, but we'll see how two oxen were yoked together. How the yoke was custom fit to each ox for optimum comfort. And how the burden was shared and the load easy to bear. We will see how being yoked with Christ also means that we are no longer taking our own path or direction, but allowing the master, Jesus, to direct us. Yes, we relinquish control and follow the guide from the yoke of Jesus only. Placing Jesus, or placing on Jesus our own yoke and all that baggage we carry around. Now, that is something that's, that's life-changing, as we will see. And verse 3 or the number three point, verse 29, also says, learn from me. What is it that Jesus wants us to learn from him? The verse continues and says, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Matthew 19, 29 and 30 says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. And Mark 9, 35, sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and a servant of all. So we look at this, and we are learning from Christ. But what are we really learning? We're learning how much this goes against our carnal nature, against every very fiber of our being. And yet Jesus says in Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, we have to give up self. He says, he cannot be my disciple. So submitting um, even ourselves as a requirement to truly learning of him. If you have ever completely trusted in Christ and seen the outcome, you know what this means. We will see how denial of self is mandatory to learn all that Jesus has to teach us. So let's read the rest of verse 29 and see what happens when we are gentle and humble in heart. And it ends with, and you will find rest for your souls. We will learn in today's lesson what Jesus wants to give everyone who comes to him, takes his yoke, and learns from him. And Mary, can you tell us about Sunday? I will give you rest. Yes, I definitely will. As we continue studying our quarterly, quarterly theme on rest in Christ, we're now going to focus on on one of, if not, the most quoted scripture regarding rest. And that is found in Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 to 28. However, before we read it, let's get some background information on this passage. Who is speaking? It's Jesus. 
Who is he speaking to? Jews and to multitudes. How do we know that? In the same chapter, verse 1, we read that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And verse 7 states, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John. So he's speaking to his countrymen. Now that we know the background and setting for this chapter, we can better understand the context surrounding this statement. Matthew 11, 20 to 28 reads, Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest." So what are some key points that Jesus is making here? The first one, well, it's harsh, critical denunciation towards important Galilean cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Two, he's not showing favoritism towards his own cities and people. And three, he's unfavorably comparing these prominent Jewish cities to extremely wicked Gentile cities. These statements mark a turning point in the Gospel of Matthew. Up to this point, he hasn't mentioned any such condemnation in his preaching. And then in verse 25, verses 25 to 27, he changes gears and brings the Father interview. Let's focus on verse 27. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. What does Jesus say about his relationship with the Father? All things are delivered, that could be committed, handed over, or entrusted to him by his Father. No one knows the, fa the Son except the Father, the third point, no one knows the Father except the Son. And lastly, and the only other people who know the Father are those whom the Son chooses to reveal the Father to. Now, why does Jesus make this statement? He's letting us know that because all things have been delivered to him, and because no one knows him except the Father, and no one knows the Father except him, and because he is the only one through whom we can receive a knowledge of the Father, and because he has given his disciples knowledge of the Father and heavenly things, for all of these reasons, we can believe the next statement he is going to pronounce in verse 28. Here are his comforting, inviting words. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He is able to give us rest because of his divinity and his oneness with the Father. He doesn't want anyone to feel shut out from his care and love. 
But we have to realize that we're carrying burdens that we really can't carry alone. Most of us won't come to him until we realize this. Jesus' invitation is need-based. He starts with an imperative, come. Come means to move or travel towards something. There is a precondition to finding rest, and that is to come to Jesus. Salvation through Jesus Christ is a wonderful gift from God that cannot be earned. However, in the end, we have to make the choice to come to Jesus and surrender our will to him. If we don't accept that invitation, we'll never find true rest. Our Savior's words are a prescription for the healing of physical, mental, and spiritual ills. Though men have brought suffering upon themselves by their own wrongdoing, he regards them with pity. In him they may find help. He will do great things for those who trust in him. That's from Councils for the Church, page 217. And another quote, that I'd like to read from Desire of Ages, says, Come unto me is his invitation. Whatever your anxieties and trials, spread out your case before the Lord. Your spirit will be braced for endurance. The way will be opened for you. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger will you become in his strength. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed the rest in casting them upon the burden bearer. The rest Christ offers depends upon conditions, but these conditions are plainly specified. They are those with which all can comply. He tells us just how his rest is to be found. That's from Desire of Ages, pages 329. So with that said, we'll continue to Monday's lesson and further delve into this passage. Amen. Amen. Greg, can you tell us about Take My Yoke Upon You? Yes. Thank you, Byron. And again, good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. And as you're going to see, we're going to adopt a policy in the Bible teaching that is called repeat and enlarge. So we're going to be repeating a number of verses, but just enlarging on on the meanings and the definitions behind them just to give a full perspective. So with that said, again, Monday's lesson is entitled, Take My Yoke Upon You. So let's all begin by reading Matthew, again, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, so to begin to unpack this a little bit, I want to just give a little bit of a background here. As we know in the Old Testament, if we look at Exodus 20 verses 1 through 17, God gave us 10 commandments representing God's moral law that represents his character, which is based on love. So these laws, as we know, were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant, right? Okay, then in addition to this, God expanded upon this and he gave Moses what is known as the Mosaic Law, which supports the, uh, the Ten Commandments, but this was given for daily guidance and governance to the Israelites and to point them back to the Ten Commandments. These laws also contained the sacrificial laws. So these laws were placed on the side of the Ark of the Covenant. And if we remember from previous lessons, the first five books of the Bible, known in the Jewish faith as the Torah, contains about 613 laws. And you think, wow, 613 laws, that sure sounds like a lot. But again, keep in mind, these laws were to guide and redirect God's people on a daily basis back to him. And as they had just come out of 400 years captivity in Egypt, they were filled with pagan practices, customs, and traditions. So God provided a means, instruction, laws, as a way for his chosen people to be redirected back to him and to teach them about his character, his way of governance, his plan of restoration, his plan of salvation. Okay, now 
unfortunately what had happened was the religious leaders of ancient Israel ritualized his law and added many, many laws, their own laws, that were based on their interpretations, their customs, and their traditions to God's law, thus changing the original intent of his law. These were originally what they call these added laws were known as the oral Torah. And eventually they wrote, they wrote these down, they codified them, they wrote them down, and they became today is what we call the Talmud. There's a little bit more behind that, but not for today's lesson. But these became an overriding and exceedingly heavy burden upon God's people. And as scripture tells us, Jesus admonished the religious leaders for doing this. He does this in Matthew 15, 9 and Mark 7, 7. But we're just going to read Matthew 15, 9. And Jesus says, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And then here we are today to put in perspective God's yoke. He has 613 laws and the world's yoke. And in my research for today's lesson, I came across some information. This dates back to December 29th of 2018. So it's relatively recent, but it'll give you a perspective. And this was from CBS News in San Francisco. And this was regarding the laws that the retiring former Governor Jerry Brown, in his last year of office, he signed into law more than 1,000 new laws. Okay, that's 1,000 new laws. And if you include those numbers plus his two extended terms as governor, which were from 1975 to 1983, and from 2011 to 2019, he vetoed 1,829 bills and saw 17,851 bills that became law. So if we look at that, and in addition to, um, to this information, there's a, an agency out there called globalregulation.com, and they estimate that the number of federal laws are in excess of 56,000 laws. So again, I wanted to provide this as a perspective because when people first hear about the Old Testament containing over uh, 613 laws, people think, wow, that's so much. That, that's, that's almost incomprehensible. But put it in perspective of the other laws that were laid upon humanity and in our society today. And if we look at today all the different pressures that are brought upon us, the expectations and status and materialism and pressures of social media, what kind of yoke do you think we're subjected to? What yoke is a greater burden, the law of God or the law of man? So what kind of yoke is Jesus speaking of? One that is laden with heavy burdens of man or is Jesus inviting us to take his yoke, united in purpose with him, where he will lead us, he will guide us, for his yoke is easy and his burden is light? Which yoke do you want to submit to? The question is, why does Jesus ask us to take his yoke right after he is invited to give him, right after he has invited us to give to him our burdens and find true rest? Well, he does so because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So let's dig into that just a little further here. The Greek word for yoke is pronounced zugos, meaning coupling. It literally means a beam of balance, scales, a pair of balances. Figuratively or metaphorically, from a worldly perspective, it can mean servitude, a burden or bondage as that of slavery. It can also mean united in purpose. And Ellen White states in The Desire of Ages, page 329, that the yoke is an instrument of service that we may be co-workers with him and that the yoke that binds to service is the law of God, his law of love. So when Jesus invites us to take his yoke upon us, Jesus is inviting us not to be in suppressive bondage, but to be co-workers with him in service. And in today's lesson, they point out three different imperatives, but I'll just add a fourth real quickly. The first is that Jesus invites us to come to him in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Jesus is inviting us all to come to him. And the second is in Matthew 29, 
Jesus invites us to take his yoke. This is a gift from Jesus that he's offering to those who are willing to accept it. And third is to learn from him. Jesus is inviting us to learn from him, to be co-workers with him, for he is gentle and lowly in heart. And the fourth is that we will find rest for our souls in him. So we will find that rest. That's the result of accepting his gift of salvation and accepting his yoke upon him. The Greek word for rest is anapau, and Thayer's lexicon describes rest as to cause or permit one to cease from any movement or labor in order to recover and collect his strength. How beautiful is that? Is that what we experience in today's world? So in closing, I just want to read just one passage from The Desire of Ages, page 330. And Ellen White says, Jesus says, Learn of me, says Jesus, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest. We are to enter the school of Christ, to learn from him meekness and lowliness. Redemption is that process by which the soul is trained for heaven. This training means a knowledge of Christ. It means emancipation from ideas, habits, practices, that have been gained in the school of the prince of darkness. So the question is, are you going to keep the yoke of bondage and submission in the ways of this world? Or are you willing to submit yourself to Jesus and to take his yoke, his way as expressed in his laws of love, to learn from him, to learn his ways so that you can receive his rest and to be a blessing to others? So what's your choice going to be? Byron, I'll hand it back to you. Amen. And, you know, we could go for another 10 minutes on we this, could. but unfortunately, <laughs> even Sabbath, Shabbat, means rest. Amen. 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 So, okay, we're going to look at Tuesday now. I am gentle and lowly in heart. And we're going to read um, verse Matthew 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. And we've read that before, and yes, it's a repeat, but, um, and it says, I am humble. Um, other verses say lowly in heart, but really the word translates to either or, the Greek word. It says, I am gentle and lowly or humble in heart. What, we're gonna dig into exactly what a humble heart is like. Let's start by looking at two words, gentle and humble. And this is from Merriam-Webster. Gentle is free from harshness, sternness, or violence. And humble is not proud or haughty, not arrogant or assertive. So how does the world look at these two things, these two words? Gentle is a good thing, right? I mean, after all, the word gentleman means a gentle man. Hopefully not a, a rogue or a rough man. Not someone who is coarse or anything like that. Yet, our culture teaches us to be assertive and bold, to be number one. I'm going to use sports as an example since I am a guy. You know, go get them, Tiger, for the kids or, or for the team. Go dominate them or, or fight team fight or normal, right? Let's look at pro teams, football. The New England Patriots, those Revolutionary War soldiers. The Philadelphia Eagles, what a fierce bird of prey that is. Or the Minnesota Vikings, those raiders and conquerors. Could you imagine a team called Gentle Lambs? No. We like to think that we are gentle, but in truth, it's all about us and how we can succeed in the world today. It's a reflection of our conquer and win attitude. So how does the world view being humble? In the world, you need to, get, to be a go-getter, right? To be first, to remember the early bird gets the worm, or a better one, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? <laughs> Which simply means that if I make more of a ruckus than anyone else, I will get whatever it is I'm looking for faster than anyone else. Definitely opposite of humble and lowly or lowly. Gentleness and humility are viewed as weakness today. Lack of ambition or drive. Simply put, if you are gentle and humble, you're going nowhere in life. 
by the world standards. You may even be labeled as spineless or worthless. The best modern example of gentle and humble, this is modern, mind you, would be Mahatma Gandhi and the policy of nonviolence and civil disobedience and the campaign to free India from British rule. He brought the British rulers of India to their knees and ultimately won independence for India from Britain. Not one shot was fired. Nobody was assaulted or beaten, at least not by those seeking or protesting and seeking freedom. They just refused to do what the government told them to do. They refused to participate. They went on strike with gentleness and humility and meekness, but with a firm resolve. So I have to ask, was Jesus spineless and weak? Because we know he was gentle and humble. Did he go anywhere in life, as the world would put it? He wasn't weak, and he changed the world. The Roman culture during Jesus' time was worse than it is today, at least at this present time. Don't worry, we're catching up. Let's look at some examples in the Bible of boldly being meek, gentle, and humble. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 10.1. Now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who, uh, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. I like that, and that's from the lesson, but I want to throw a few others that are not at you. 1 Corinthians 4.21, what do you desire? Shall I come to you with the rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? What would you rather have God do, beat you up or help you learn to be better? In Philippians 4.5, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. So let's see this gentle and humble and heart spirit in action. We're going to read John 8, 10 through 11. And this is about the woman caught in adultery. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. This is just one of many examples from Jesus being gentle and humble. The lesson talks about Moses and how he offered his life to save Israel. In Numbers 12, 3, it talks about how Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. And look what he accomplished through God, of course. But let's look at the humbleness of Jesus and our ultimate example of gentleness and humbleness. Isaiah, we start off with Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. Now we're going to see this, that Christ did not defend himself or fight back or anything. So let's see more of this in action, of this, this quiet before his shearers. Luke 22, 63 through 65. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody, and this is after Peter denies him three times, in custody were mocking him and beating him, and they blindfolded him and were asking him, saying, Prophecy, who is the one who hit you? And they were saying many other things against him, blaspheming. We can look at Matthew 27, 12, where Jesus is accused before Pilate. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. And in Matthew 26, 62, and 63, when Jesus is before Caiaphas, the high priest stood up and said to him, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now Jesus does finally answer. We're not going to get into that. That's a whole different lesson. But and Isaiah 53, 6, and this is the ultimate act of humility. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. That's Jesus, and that's you and me. 
Not only did Jesus say nothing about the accusations against him, but he also paid the price for all of our sin. At the cross was the ultimate act of humility. When the Son of Man, the Prince of Heaven, came down to this earth, lived a sinless life, and then offered himself as a sacrifice to atone for the sin of the world that he took upon himself so that we may have life through him. He took our punishment so that we could have life through his righteousness that he imparts to us. And I look at this and it still blows my mind. Even I look at Paul and Silas in Acts 16, 23 through 25. And this was one there in Philippi. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. We cannot of our own nature even comprehend such a thing to be singing praises while you're tending to your wounds from being freshly beaten so let's look at this though this this humility that comes into us from Christ how does it apply to us today so we might not be in prison beaten and bloody I get it right that's well maybe someday at the very end but for now how do we show that character to the world today? And Philippians 2, 3 says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Like Paul and Silas, this will never happen unless Jesus is the Lord of your life. Because without him, it can't happen, period. Invite him into your heart today that you too may have a gentle and humble heart and spirit in your lives. Mary, can you tell us about, for my yoke is easy. Yes. Compared to ours, oh yes. Much easier. In this section, we're going to dig deeper into the first half of verse 30, which states, for my yoke is easy. As we've seen, a yoke is traditionally known as an instrument of service. It's also used as a metaphor for united purpose. We've also learned how in Judaism, one of the uses of the word was in reference to a wrong understanding of the law. Christ came to teach us a right understanding of the law. The Greek word translated as easy in this verse can be translated as Good, pleasant, useful, benevolent, and better. Do we look at God's law as easy, good, pleasant, useful, and benevolent? Or do we view it as heavy-handed, difficult to live up to, and perhaps even irrelevant? I'd like to share a quote from the Desire of Ages that sheds important insight on this verse. A yoke is an instrument of service. Cattle are yoked for labor, and the yoke is essential that they may labor effectually. By this illustration, Christ teaches us that we are called to service as long as life shall last. We are to take upon us his yoke, that we may be co-workers with him. And she continues, the yoke that binds to service is the law of God. The great law of love revealed in Eden, proclaimed upon Sinai, and in the new covenant written in the hearts is that which binds the human worker to the will of God. He desires that we shall patiently and wisely take up the duties of service the yoke of service Christ himself has borne in humanity. He said, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. That's from Psalms 40, verse 8, and that is found in Desire of Ages, page 329. 
In this verse, Jesus is helping us to understand that his yoke is his law, the Ten Commandments. And when we're united as co-workers with him, our lives will be service-oriented towards others, fulfilling God's will. What a beautiful way of understanding and applying Jesus' yoke to our lives. Now, the lesson continues by contrasting Jesus' easy yoke to what Paul calls a yoke of bondage. Let's read Galatians 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. So what is Paul saying here? First, He's warning us to hold on to the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Second, don't get entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What is this liberty by which Christ has made us free? In Isaiah 61.1, Jesus said, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, So we're captives that need liberty. What are we captives of? Romans 6, 17 and 18 helps us answer that question so that we know what are we captives of. And that reads, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We're told we were slaves of sin and have been set free from sin. I'd like to share a few more quotes on this topic from Ellen White. In Lift Him Up, page 208, many come who are slaves of sin the helpless victims of evil evil habits. Many are convicted and converted as they by faith grasp the promise of God for the forgiveness of their sins, the bondage of habit is broken. Forsaking their sinful indulgences, they become free men or women in Christ Jesus and rejoice in the liberty of the sons of God. The second quote is from in heavenly places. Those who believe on Christ and obey his commandments are not under bondage to God's law. For to those who believe and obey, his law is not a law of bondage, but of liberty. Clearly, we can stand in the liberty by which Christ made us free from slaves of sin. And those who believe in Christ and obey his commandments are under a law of liberty, not of bondage. That's point number one. Now, what's this yoke of bondage Paul is referring to? The context of this chapter in Galatians is the issue about circumcision circumcision versus uncircumcision. Should it be required or not? Remember, As Greg had said, the Jews for centuries had perverted God's law with meaningless requirements and had made its observance an intolerable burden. Therefore, it became a yoke of bondage, which Paul is referring to. Here, he is expounding on this observance of circumcision in verse 6 of that same chapter. He's asking, are you justified by the law in verse 4? Or should we have hope of righteousness by faith in verse 5? Ultimately, it comes down to faith that works by love in verse 6. And in verse 13, he makes the connection between living in liberty and in loving service for one another. Galatians 5.13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And in verse 14, he connects the service to God's law. He says, in verse 14, it ends, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is a summary, really, of the last six commandments. 
I want to add one more verse, just in case someone is still thinking that God's law or his yoke is heavy and difficult. Please read 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. In summary, we need to remember that Jesus says his yoke is easy. God's great law of love, the Ten Commandments, is good, easy, pleasant. There is another yoke of bondage which keeps us slaves to selfishness and sin with meaningless requirements resulting in intolerable burdens. We choose which yoke we want to be attached to. May God help us make the right choice daily. Amen. Amen. Oh, I know how many yokes Satan can offer. <laughs> I'll take God's any day. <laughs> so, Greg, can you tell us about My Burden is Light? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. So, again, Thursday's lesson is titled My Burden is Light. And we're going to look at what this means. What does Jesus mean by when he says, my burden is light. So we're going to look at this from two vantage points. First, we're going to look at Jesus' example, and then we're going to look at burden in terms of today, in practical terms, in the context of how we as Christians can help others with their burdens. So I'm just going to read Matthew 11:30 once again to begin. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Greek word for burden is fortion. And fortion, it means like an invoice, a bill of lading as far as um, freight is concerned. That's the easiest way to think of that is someone does the heavy work and then you pay the bill. You pay the price for that. So that's what, um, that's what the meaning actually is describes it as. Thayer's Greek lexicon, I like that because it goes a little deeper in describing the meaning than does Strong's Concordance. And it states burden metaphorically as a burdensome rights, such as in Matthew 24 and Luke 11:46. So let's look at Matthew 24 and Luke 11:46. So Matthew 23 verse 4, for they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. And Luke 11:46 states it in a very similar way. And he says, Woe to you also, lawyers, who load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So we're looking at a comparison of burdensome rights that people were put under not only in ancient Israel's time, but in today's time as well. And we're comparing that versus the obligations that Christ lays upon his followers and the styles and burden by way of contrast is that to the precepts of the Pharisees and observance of which was most oppressive. That's what Thayer's Greek lexicon says. And it says the consciousness of which oppresses the soul. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about burden. And when we're looking at light, what do we mean by that? In the uh, Strong's Concordance, it means light, easy. But in Thayer's Greek lexicon, it goes a little further, and it's used figuratively concerning the commandments of Jesus as being easy to keep. Easy to keep in him. We can't do that without him. Without him, it's impossible to do. But with Jesus dwelling within us through the Holy Spirit, we can. His laws are easy to keep. Why? Because we love him. So in the context of this week's lesson, as we read the scripture from Matthew 11:30, Jesus is telling us that his requirements, what he asks of us, is light as we discussed in previous lessons this week as well, Jesus invites us to lay aside the heavy yoke and burdens of this world that we're all facing, we're all struggling with, and to take his yoke upon us. Why? Well, he answers that question once again. And I know it sounds repetitive, but it's, it's imperative that we understand. That he's, say, he's pleading with us 
leave the burdens of this world. They're heavy and they just keep increasing and increasing. But his is light. Why? Because his requirements, his bill of lading is light in him. And as a result, he promises us that we shall find rest to our souls. So if we're willing and if we exercise our faith in him, he will do the heavy lifting for us. He won't do everything for us because he wants us to be active participants in his blessings. Example one, if we look at Matthew chapter 9 or in Mark chapter 2, the example of the paralytic. Well, Jesus was providing the forgiveness of sins and the healing, but the paralytic had to stand up and pick up his mat and walk. He had to play an active role. Also, another example is the blind man that Jesus healed in John 9. Jesus used some saliva and some of the clay on the ground and put that over his eyes. But the man had to go and wash that. He played an active role in that, so he had to wash that away. So what Jesus is saying is, look, what I'm asking of you is light. I'm doing the heavy lifting for you. I mean, what a blessing. What a blessing that Jesus is willing to do most of the heavy lifting for us if, if we are willing to take his yoke, his ways upon us. And as Mary had mentioned earlier, his yoke, his way are the Ten Commandments, the law of love. When Jesus told us that his burden is light, he wanted to remind us that we can rely upon him who is the ultimate burden barrier. So, does Jesus expect us to share this blessing with others? Of course he does, right? So, how does helping or bearing one another's burdens help us to fulfill the law of Christ as stated in Mark 12, 30 through 31. Let's look at that. And he says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. So to love the Lord that God with all the heart, soul, strength, with our mind, and to love our neighbor as ourself. In Galatians 6.1, Paul states that we are to restore a person in the spirit of gentleness. Let's read Galatians 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you should also be tempted. So as Paul is stating this, he's reminding us to be gentle as well. Remember in, in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus says that he is gentle. Burden bearing means helping a brother or sister who has fallen or has gone off track or suffered a hardship or simply one who's struggling in life and needs help or encouragement or compassion. Is that what I do? Sadly, not often enough. I need to do more. Not because it's works-based, but to have Christ working in my heart, to have that love and compassion to help a fellow neighbor, friend, work colleague. So let me ask you this. Is that what you do? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit that when you see someone either in your church family, a neighbor, a work colleague that's struggling or in need of compassion, do you step up to help them as well, to help carry their burdens? Jesus wants us to remember to love thy neighbor as thyself. We all have burdens from time to time, and some have more or worse than others. But at some point, we could all use some help with the burdens we carry. By sharing or helping those who we know are carrying heavy burdens, we are demonstrating our love for God and loving thy neighbor as thyself. Thus, we're fulfilling the law of God. So who do you know that needs your help today? Who is weighed down with heavy burdens? Are you willing to help? Jesus helps us in our time of need with our burdens. Are we willing to help those in their time of need with their burdens? I'll turn that back over to you, Byron. Well, and even I love on a different aspect, Christ already paid for all of our sins. Most of our burdens come from sin. So that's yes, why it's so amen. easy for him to take our burdens mm -hmm. and to give us his easy ones as well. Amen. 
So let me ask you, Greg, do you have any final thoughts for today? The, the final thought is this. It seems like in Christianity today, a lot of people focus on that we're no longer under the law, we're under grace. We are under grace. We have always been under grace. And the law that we're not under is a sacrificial law. And I want to read this. Mary had mentioned this earlier before, that God's law is a law of love. And I love Psalms 40, verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. It's a love conversion of the heart. That's what God's law is. Amen. Mary. I just want to um, reiterate how important it is for us to come to Christ. He said, I will give you rest, but we have to come first. And we choose which yoke we want to carry. Do we want to continue carrying the yoke of bondage or the yoke of his law of love? I think it's, it's an easy choice, but we're tempted many times to go with the yoke of bondage. So may the Holy Spirit always help us to stay connected and choose to be co-workers with Christ and take his yoke. That, that carnal flesh really does a number on us, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. <clears throat> I read this and that I may know him by Ellen White, and it fits so perfectly for today. Um, this is that I may know him, page 175. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth, resisteth it's the old English that gets me, the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. That's First Peter 5, 5. How many cling with tenacious grasp to their self-termed dignity, which is only self-esteem. Those seek to honor themselves instead of waiting in humbleness on, of heart for Christ to honor them. In conversion, more time is spent in talking of self than in exalting the riches of the grace of Christ. True holiness and humility are inseparable. The nearer the soul comes to God, the more completely it is, is it humbled and subdued. When Job heard the voice of the Lord out of the whirlwind, he exclaimed, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And that's Job 42.6. It was when Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord and heard the cherubim crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, that he cried out, Woe is me, for I am undone. And that's Isaiah 6, 3 and 5. Daniel, when visited by the holy messenger, says, My comeliness was turned in me into corruption. And that's Daniel 10, 8. Paul, after he was caught up into the third heaven and heard things that it was not lawful for a man to utter, speaks of himself as less than least of all saints. And that's Ephesians 3.8. It was the beloved John who leaned on Jesus' breath and beheld his glory, who fell as one dead before the angel. The more closely and continuously we behold our Savior, the less shall we see to approve in ourselves. He who catches a glimpse of the matchless love of Christ counts all things as loss and looks upon him as the chiefest among 10,000 and as the one altogether lovely. As seraphim and cherubim look upon Christ, they cover their faces with their wings. Their own perfection and beauty are not displayed in the presence of glory of their Lord, or presence and glory of their Lord. Then now, or then how improper it is for men to exalt themselves. Let them rather be clothed with humility, cease all strife for supremacy, and learn what it means to be meek and lowly of heart. He who contemplates God's glory and infinite love will have humble views of himself, but by beholding the character of God, he will be changed into his divine image. Amen. 
This is what a humble heart can do. This is what God wants to do with each one of us. The choice we have is ours, though. Do we let him into our hearts to transform us? Or do we continue in the tenacious grasp for our self-term dignity? God offers us so much, and all we have to do is pick it. But it's so hard to let go of self. So true. And we studied that a few lessons back. It's the hardest thing we'll ever do in this life. So our prayer is that you choose God, that you let him into your heart to make you gentle and have a heart of meekness, of humility, of lowliness, Amen. that we all might realize the riches and glory and beauty he has for us. Let's pray. Lord, you showed us the, the ultimate in humility on the cross where the king of heaven the son the, the, of the living God part of the Godhead and yet you came down and took the lowest of positions you became a servant Lord to show us the character that we must possess to be in line with you there is no haughtiness. There is no exaltation of ourselves, Lord. That is the distinction between creator and creation. And Lord, we look to you for guidance as our creator, that we truly might have life and have it abundantly, not Amen. only in this world here and now, but Lord, with you for all eternity, to realize the true riches and beauty of your name. Lord, I pray that these words might take heart in everyone viewing. And Lord, that we might all become servants for Christ and co-laborers for Christ in this world, that we might share one another's burdens. And Lord, that we might not exalt each other, or not exalt ourselves, but exalt each other, Lord, as you have exalted us. Guide us in your word and your ways. We pray all these things to you, our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen, Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.